Colton, can you put it on our logo? Thank you. Good man. Um, okay. So, what, what's our time? Let's see how much time do I have. Can I? Okay, cool. We've got plenty of time. Starting last August, we started the process of exegetical study. All right? We started the process of where we read all of Luke, and then we started John. We started John right around November, December-ish. And the whole point of this, the whole idea, is to teach you how to truly study Scripture. To have the courage to ask the hard questions. To say, hold on, I don't understand. God, why did you say that? Jesus, why did you do that? Or, Jacob, why do you believe that? Or, Miranda, why is your perspective that way? To understand the way that we believe things. Because the more that we spend time together, the more that we build this family, and the more that we learn about our beliefs, the more we learn about Jesus and build a relationship through Him, the better we have to understand who God is. You see, all of you are friends. All of you are family. All of you spend time together. You text, you Snapchat, you Instagram. So you're constantly learning about the likes, the dislikes. You constantly are learning about their buttons, things that upset them. But how do you do this with God? How do you do this with this invisible, infinite person? How do you do this with this person who consists of three people? You can't just simply go, uh, okay, hey, I'm going to selfie, hey, God. No, that's, that's not the way, the way it works. He doesn't have a cell phone. He doesn't have a Snapchat. This is the cell phone. This is the way that you get to know God, is by reading His Scripture. And, and listen, all right, I'm going to tell you firsthand. I'm, I'm going to speak truth to you right now. I am a dyslexic. Reading Scripture is infinitely difficult for me. So basically what I do is I listen to it. Now, as I've gotten older, as I've trained myself, as I've gone through seminary, I have grown a, a better ability to read Scripture, to under, understand Scripture. So I understand where you're coming from. I relate to how difficult it is for you to read Scripture. How can you open up Genesis and read this long list of people that you don't know, never met, you can't even pronounce their names? That's boring. That, that just causes you to stop reading it. Well, that's the point of this whole year. From August to May, that's what we're learning how to do. Is we're, we're learning how to read God's Word. We're learning how to listen to God's Word. We're learning how to ask those hard questions. And so tonight, we're continuing our reading. We're in John chapter 6, and we're going to do something a little different. All right? Previously, when, when I did this, all of last semester... I would read the first half of the chapter, and the second half you would read and talk about in discipleship groups. So that I'm not. All right? As I was praying over chapter 6, as I read it and reread it and thought about it, God kept on saying, no, I don't want you to do in the beginning of the chapter. Okay? That's not what I want. I want you to focus on the second half of the chapter. So what you're going to do in discipleship groups is you're actually going to go back and you're going to read the first part of chapter 6. Because that's what we're, we're not reading that right now. We're reading the second half. So bear with me. It's a lot of scripture. There's a lot of verses here. But I'm reading uh, John chapter 6, verses 25 through 59. So just bear with me for a second. It's a lot of stuff to take in. This is God's word. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You were looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, all right, this is the work of God, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the man in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. 
For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He, will never, he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him who comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the man in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise up him at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my drink is real drink. Or my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for your patience and your grace with us. Lord, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share your word to these kids. Lord, use this time to transform the hearts of every person in this room. Use this message to change 2018 so that it be a, a year all about you. That it be a year gifted by you so that we may have life this year. Lord, take me away so it's not my message, but let it be your message. In your name I pray. Amen. That was a lot. All right, there's a lot to unpack. To give you a little bit of context about what's going on, all right, so you have a better understanding of what Jesus is talking about, and you're going to read this when you get to the discipleship groups, is that Jesus just performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000, okay? Now, what's really unique about John, unlike the other three Gospels, is that when Jesus does the miracle of feeding the 5,000, there is no teaching associated to it. He just simply feeds them, and then he goes away. And we're going to talk about that in the discipleship groups after, after the message is over. But you see, what happened is that all these people who Jesus fed, they didn't want to leave Jesus aside. So they hunted them down and they found him in Capernaum. But what does Jesus say about this? What did, what did he say? I tell you the truth, you were looking for me not because you saw a miraculous sign, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You see, these are a group of people who had nothing. They had less than nothing. Every day was a battle. Every day was a hardship. Every day they were persecuted and hunted down. Every day they had to pay to Caesar money they didn't have. So this man comes out of nowhere and gives them all the food they can eat. I mean, this is not like a simple snack, okay? This is not what we're going to do here at communion. This is like your belly is bulging eating. I mean, it is like I am catatonic because I eat so much. 
That's how much he fed them. All right? That's 5,000 people. So if you have nothing, you have less than nothing, isn't it rational to think that you would follow the person who provides you food? And that's what they did. You see, Jesus isn't condemning them for following him. He isn't saying, man, you're evil people, you're horrible people because you don't believe in me. You just want me for food. You're just using me. You're just manipulating me. And he's simply stating a fact. He's simply making an observation that, hey, you don't understand what's going on. You don't understand what happened. That's the reason why I left you. That's the reason why I came over here to Capernaum. Because I, I can see your hearts. I can see truth. I can understand that you just needed food. You just want food. That's not my job. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to save you. So this is what he does. He spends an entire section focusing on the fact that he's giving up himself. And there's something that I, want to, that I want to read to you again that, that's very, very important. Verse 35. Je then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. I am. This is very, very important. You see, previous to this, Jesus had kind of only alluded to the idea that he was from God. He kind of only skated around the idea that he was the Messiah. He hadn't really kind of said, yes, I am the Messiah. I am the one that you've been waiting for. But in this moment, when all of these people are, are trying to hunt him down, trying to get him to feed them again, he is making that declaration. Okay, you didn't understand me before. You did not understand the sign. So I'm going to tell you plan. I'm going to tell you really easily. I am. All right? There's none of this, like, what did he mean? I'm like, do I need to read between the lines? I think, no, it is. Plain and simple, I am the bread of life. And he goes on to explain how everything that we have in this world is meaningless. Without him. You see, these cell phones, things that some of you got for Christmas, things that you were super excited about, mean nothing. These, these are worthless. This is pointless to have without Christ. What does that mean? What does it mean that everything is worthless without Christ? Well, Jesus explains this. You see, he talks about Moses. This is, this is the time where, where the Israelites had left Egypt and they were wandering the desert. Okay? This is a time where they didn't have a home. They didn't have crops. They didn't have herds. And they were basically just trying to live day to day. But yet, because they had the chosen people, God provided them manna. He provided them food and water. And Jesus goes on to say, that's just food and water. Right? What happened? What happened to Moses? What happened to the Israelites? They're all dead. Are they here with us now? No. Because it, it meant nothing. It was just to fill their stomachs. Cell phones, Xbox, clothes, shoes, cars, everything that you desire, it means nothing. It has no value without Christ. Because Christ uses those things to magnify your life. But see, because we don't believe in Jesus, just like these people, we want more. We need more. Man, I got this cheap GoPro for Christmas. I want the Samsung Galaxy S8. Or I want an iPhone 9. Man, what's wrong with that? This is what I want. It, because we crave that. Because we need that. Because there's no life in it. What happens? We get disappointed. We get upset. Man, I just had an Xbox 360. I wanted an Xbox One for Christmas. Mom, that didn't get it for me. Now, there's no video games to play on that. You see, I want more. I need more. Man, I got an Xbox One, but I'm bored with it. Maybe if I get a PlayStation 4. Yeah, that's what I need to do. Ah, uh, man, I'm bored with PlayStation 4. Maybe I get a Nintendo Switch. Nah, I'm bored with that. What's the next thing? And this is exactly what these people are dealing with. Now, granted, they, they didn't have the same, like, the same sort of technology, but that's what Jesus was talking about. Because that bread, that water meant nothing. It didn't give them life. It didn't fulfill them. They always needed more. Uh, eventually, when they became prosperous, yeah, this coat that looks good, I, I, I look good at it, but that's, that's, that was yesterday. I want today's stuff. I want tomorrow's stuff. 
Man, this bread tastes good, but you know if I put some of that, that expensive salt on it, man, that's going to taste real good. Oh man, I've eaten salt now. I want something more. This is what the Israelites were thinking. This is what these people were thinking. And he's going on saying, no, stop for a second. Guys, stop for a second. Stop thinking about yourself. cell phone. Stop thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow. And really listen to me. Because the one who created me is speaking right now. He's speaking truth into your lives. And he's telling you, none of that thing that you desire, that doesn't matter. My seniors, listen to me right now. That program, that degree, that career that you want, it means nothing. It's not going to give you anything except for stress and heartache. It's not going to provide you anything. What, you get a nice home? Cool, good for you. I got a home. Doesn't make me any better. That's going to give you a car? Great. And that car's going to break down. Then you're going to buy a new car. You see, what God wants you to do is He wants you focusing on Him. He wants you focusing on what He provides. You. Community. Friends. Family, as we saw on the board. You see, when you believe in Jesus, when you believe in this meal, you enter into a new relationship. You enter into something that you've never experienced before. Something that's so much more important than these cell phones. So much more important than bread and wine. And if you, if you continue this reading, it's really, really funny. Jesus finally starts to call them out. Verse 61. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Did I insult you? Good. Deal with it. Because the truth is, the truth is, you're not listening. You're not listening that I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Yeah. I took the junior high and, and Miranda over to the movies last week. And we saw Jumanji. And on their wrists, when they got to the game, they had three tattoos. And each one was a life. Alright? Every time they died, they would spawn back in. They would fall from the sky, spawn back where their friends were at. You see, that's the way we wish life was. Man, I screwed up today. I wish I could just respawn and do the day over again. But no, it doesn't happen that way. But it can. Maybe not necessarily resetting that day, but tomorrow through believing in communion, believing in the one who gave it to you. You can change your life today and tomorrow. You can do something different and new. We're now coming into a time of communion. I want to invite the band to come on up. I want to share a story with you guys. All right. I want to share some truth with you. I want to testify about this idea of Life that comes from this. Last December, the staff met for our Christmas party. And every year, SPR gives us a bonus. Uh, this year, they gave us $300. And I had been holding on to the $300 because I had been wanting to buy a hunting rifle. I'd gone hunting with some family last November, and I just kind of caught the bug. And I, I really enjoyed it, and I want to do it more often. In fact, I want to do it with you guys. I want to actually take a trip and go and, and spend some time alone with God and, and go hunting. I got a, a uh, home theater system from Natalie's parents for Christmas, but I can't use the speakers because I needed an audio-video receiver. So I was going to spend this $300 on, on that. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to satisfy my own needs. I wanted to make my life better. But yesterday when I was at uh, Walmart, when I was leaving actually, when I had gone to get some snacks for confirmation, when I was leaving, I saw this guy off the distance. He was kind of walking around the parking lot, and he was panhandling. He was trying to get people to give him money. And I'll be honest with you, I really wasn't in the mood to deal with him. I really wasn't in the mood to interact with him. And so I put my head down and I just ignored him, and I walked right past him. And this is the man that I've already given money to before. I did the same thing last year. I had given him money when he had asked me. But I didn't want to do that this year. Because I wanted to, to satisfy me. Because I'm, I'm a youth pastor. This is what I dedicate my life to. I serve daily. 
So in other words, I just wanted to feel like I could satisfy myself, that I could get something. So I got in my truck and I started to drive away. But he had stopped all these cars in front of me. And by the time he got to me, because all these people said no, by the time he got to me, I pulled out my wallet and I gave him the $300. Because you see, the moment I stepped out of Walmart, I just kept on hearing God's voice. I sacrificed everything for you. So sacrifice for me. You don't need that $300. You don't need that gun. You don't need that AV system. You don't need any of that. That doesn't mean anything. That doesn't give you life. I give you life. This act of service gives you life. You are demonstrating my love to the world through your sacrifice. Three hundred dollars, three one hundred dollar bills I gave to this complete stranger. I don't know if he used it on drugs or alcohol. It didn't matter. What mattered was I served the one who serves me daily. And two thousand years ago, that's what he did. He took the bread as he was sitting there on the upper room with his disciples, and he and he broke it and he blessed it. And he's like, "Listen, this is life, guys." Your clothes, your riches, your fame, your popularity, your cell phones, your video games, everything, none of that matters. This matters. This is truth. Because this comes from me, because I am giving this to you. I'm going to break my body for you. I'm going to go to the cross so that you may live. I'm going to die so I can be with you. And he took the cup and he blessed it. This is my blood of the new covenant. All right, I'm going to shed this for you. All, right. All you sit here doing is thinking about what benefits you. All you're sitting here doing is thinking, Jesus, when are you going to stop talking? My belly's full. I'm ready to go to bed. It's late. We've been celebrating all weekend long. But no, understand this, my disciples, my children. This blood is for you. I'm doing it freely so that you can be with me. Because the truth is, the truth is, my children, the truth is, I love you so much that I leave paradise for you. I love perfection for you. I love my Father for you. That's a powerful message. This is what he was explaining to all the people he had fed. But they didn't hear it. They couldn't hear truth. They refused to hear truth. This table is not the Methodist table. This table is not my table. This table is not the relevant use of the table. This is Christ's table. This is open to everyone. This is open to you so that you can remember that sacrifice, so that you can understand that this, this means way more than anything you possibly own, anything you will ever do. This means more. So as you feel led, Come on up. I will serve you communion. You can come to the altar. You can pray. You can spend time with your Lord. You can spend time in prayer to get ready for this year, guys. Start this year fresh. Give up all of that desire. Just as I gave up that $300, my desire for things for myself, give it up. Give it up so that this year may be the year of the Lord. So you can put everything in 2017 to bed. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we go to communion now, I pray that you transform our lives. Lord, do not allow us to ignore you. Do whatever it takes to invade our hearts. If it means you're going to break our phones, you're going to break our TVs, our Nintendo Switches, our Xboxes, if you're going to break our computers, do what you need to do, Lord, so that it is you and only you that we focus on. Let this be a time of celebration, a time of renewal, a time that we can come and spend with you because you are our Father. Bless this food, not so that it fills our bellies, but that it fills our spirit, and not so that it fills our spirit this time, but forever. In your name I pray. Amen. The table is